Starting off with Heaven's Gate from 1980, director Michael Cimino, and he was really riding high by this point. A couple of years previously, he had won the Best Picture and the Best Director and Screenplay and Cinematography and all sorts of wonderful awards for The Deer Hunter. And the studio basically said, you are a genius. Here is a truckload of money. Go out and make more art. And too many directors of this era were being told the same thing. A lot of them were very young. And young people, I hate to say, but I've been there too, are not very good with instant fame. I haven't been there for instant fame, but uh, I can predict that if I suddenly had millions of dollars in the bank, I probably would have been just as irresponsible as these guys were. Maybe not quite, because these guys were pretty out there. Anyway, uh, Heaven's Gate is a Western, and Westerns weren't really big at this time in American history, uh, film history, uh, at the end of the 1970s. We'd been seeing all sorts of uh, other uh, cutting-edge type films, like The Graduate in 2001 and things like that, and here comes this kind of out-of-the-past Western. It was based on a uh, real series of events, the Johnson County War, that took place in Wyoming uh, somewhere around 18... 77, I think it was, something like that. And that was going to be Michael Cimino's next work of art. And so he packed up his uh, uh, crew, a rather large crew, and they went to, um, they weren't in Wyoming, I think they were in Montana, somewhere pretty far away anyway, pretty far away from Hollywood. And so it was hard for the studio and their producers to check in on Chimino, and he really wanted this to be uh, a wonderful movie. He really worked really hard, and uh, he wanted to shoot as much of the movie as he could at a particular time of day, which is known as Magic Hour, Magic Hour, and that is right around sunset, a little bit before and a little bit after sunset. The lighting is gorgeous and very flattering and, and warm in color. Uh, Magic Hour could also be around sunrise, but it's a little hard, harder to shoot at sunrise too. But right when the sun is low in the sky is uh, Magic Hour. And cinematographers love it, and, and directors, I'm sure actors and actresses, because they look so good uh, also. And Chimino also wanted it to be very realistic. And so he made sure that everybody had the right kind of of Stetson cowboy hats and the right kind of, of boots and that the uh, uh, cowboy boots and that the railroads, if they were narrow gauge, that it had to be narrow gauge uh, railroads and things like that. And a lot of this authenticity just doesn't show up on the screen. But he really felt that it had to have this, this level of authenticity and also only shooting for a few hours a day, which is going to lengthen the shoot. And studios fall into this sort of a trap. Um, psychologists and ec economists talk about throwing good money after bad. And so once you have spent uh, uh, lots of millions of dollars in today's, in today's uh, uh, dollars, if we just for inflation, it would probably be well north of $100 million, maybe even north of $200 million. And the director says, uh, look at this wonderful stuff that we've shot. Isn't it beautiful? And we're a little over budget, a little bit behind schedule, and please, we need some more money in order to finish the film. And so the studio is going to say, okay, okay, we're almost there. Sure, here's a little bit more money. And that is throwing good money after bad. If the whole movie's over budget, uh, economists and psychologists say you should just pull the plug and not waste any more money. But that's not really human nature. It's really hard for us to do that. We, we want to keep putting money into that car that doesn't work very well or keep putting money into that house uh, that seems to be falling apart uh, day by day and so on. Uh, it's really human nature, and Chimino fell prey to that, and the studio, and they kept giving him more money and kept giving him more money, and 
he kept asking for more money, and he was so far away, way up there in Montana, it was really hard for them to check in on him. And the press got word of this, and they started reporting about problems on the set, problems in, in Montana, problems at Heaven's Gate, and all of that. And instead of talking about how possibly wonderful the movie was and how gorgeous it looked and all that sort of thing, the press started reporting very, uh, very specifically about how much the movie cost. And uh, they had already, that had already always been a thing. They talked about how much money uh, um, Gone with the Wind cost and how much money Cleopatra cost back in the early 1960s was also a very big deal. Cleopatra nearly drove uh, 20th Century Fox bankrupt. And so now here we are just about 20 years later and it seems to be happening again. And the studio uh, is uh, a falling prey, right? Uh, didn't really learn their lesson, didn't, didn't learn history, didn't learn their lesson. And the press is kind of having a field day uh, over uh, all the cost and the overruns and all that. So the auteur director and the studios are going to start taking back control of the filmmaking process. We're kind of at the end of this golden age for directors in particular, and it began back when we started talking about Bonnie and Clyde and Easy Rider and The Graduate and movies like that and all the way through and so many wonderful movies that came through uh, in this era. And, uh, that, uh, that we've talked about for the last uh, couple of classes. But uh, the studio, there are too many flops, too many big budget flops, because a lot of these directors have made their wonderful work of art, and now they want to do a follow-up, and they have uh, rather enlarged egos, and sadly, a lot of them have developed uh, drug habits, uh, cocaine for the most part, makes you feel all up and ready to take on the world and all that sort of thing. Uh, a number of these directors start uh, divorcing their first wives and marrying the younger, prettier uh, actress or model, the trophy wife and that sort of thing. And, and they're, they're all young and everybody's telling them how great they are. And uh, they fall prey uh, to that whole uh, situation. So... Let's take a look at some of these big directors, and these are major directors, Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, Robert Altman. Look at the, the, all these wonderful directors, and they all start turning out bombs. Very expensive movies. There's Steven Spielberg right there on a, on a miniature, uh, shooting miniatures for his film 1941, which, by the way, I think is a pretty good movie. It's a comedy, and Spielberg... Uh, has vowed never to make another comedy again because of this this awful experience. But I think it's pretty funny. But it's a, a case of giant costs. You know, wouldn't it be funny, just like in the silent days or the slapstick days or the 1930s, if a can of paint falls on somebody's head? Well, sure, or a pie in the face, right? Slapstick stuff, very funny. So Spielberg has to up it by 10 or by 100, and now we have uh, a tank driving through a paint factory, okay? Because that'll be a lot funnier than one can of paint falling on somebody's head. Now we have a, a, a tank or a Jeep, I, it's a tank, I think, driving through a paint factory. Okay, so 1941 is set the, the days after December 7th, 1941, in Southern California, in Hollywood, and people were uh, rightfully very, very nervous that Hawaii had just been attacked uh, by the Japanese, bombed by the Japanese, and possibly they were going to uh, keep on coming, right? They would keep on coming, and California is next. And so there was a lot of reaction and overreaction and all that. So Spielberg takes all this and turns it into a comedy. He takes the hottest comedy stars of the era, a lot of people from... Saturday Night Live, like uh, like uh, uh, John Belushi and uh, and uh, Bill Murray and people like wait, not Bill Murray, sorry, John Belushi, uh, and and people like that. 
and um, making it really, really big. And comedies don't really need to be uh, $200 million movies, really. Comedy is, you know, you got some jokes and maybe some sight gags and stuff like that. But he's making it into a big, giant, expensive, like like an action movie, like a, like a superhero movie. And so, 1941, Spielberg's uh, big bomb. Martin Scorsese makes a musical, of all things, with Robert De Niro uh, playing a, uh, a jazz musician and Liza Minnelli. William Friedkin follows up The Exorcist with Sorcerer. And... Exorcist was a big, big hit, and he had won uh, the Oscar and lots of awards um, for the French Connection just prior to that. So he was on a real roll. And so people that saw The Exorcist are thinking, from the director of The Exorcist comes Sorcerer. Well, what's Sorcerer about? Well, not sorcerers. It's about truck drivers. Okay, and the sorcerer is the name of one of the trucks, and it's based on a on a pretty good French film from uh, the late 1950s, I think it is, uh, called Wages of Fear, which is a really good movie, and it takes place in South America, and they are paid money to transport dynamite over the uh, mountains, over the Andes Mountains. So, you know, it's ready for thrills and things like that and rope bridges and, and, and suspense and tension and all that kind of stuff. But don't call your movie Sorcerer because people are going to think they're going to get more of The Exorcist. Anyway, a big, big budget movie. Didn't need to be nearly as big a budget movie as it was and somehow with that really ill-advised title not a good idea. Francis Coppola follows up all of his wonderful movies, Godfather, Godfather Part Two, Apocalypse Now, with another musical, One from the Heart, a musical uh, set in Las Vegas. And it's kind of experimental. He does some uh, stuff with video, very early with video and things like that. Builds a whole strip of Las Vegas uh, and so on. I don't know what it is with these directors and musicals, they, they went to film school, they studied musicals, they loved uh, American in Paris and, and all those great musicals, and so they decide that they want to, now that they're the, the king of the mountain, that they want to make musicals. Robert Altman, Robert Altman from M.A.S.H. makes Popeye the musical. Popeye the musical, you, you, you can't believe it, it's true. Popeye the musical with Robin Williams. Robin Williams is not a singer, and they build a giant set in Malta, which is an island in the Mediterranean, because that's like Popeye's little, I don't know, his, his fishing village, something like that. A big, expensive, stupid movie, really, hate to say it. And Peter Bogdanovich, who uh, had also made some uh, 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 The Last Picture Show, some really wonderful early movies in this period, and he makes a musical too. They all laughed with his girlfriend starring in the role, Sybil Shepherd. She is not a singer. She's beautiful, a former model, turned out to be a pretty good actress uh, over the years, and uh, probably not quite a very good actress really for They All Laugh, but he decides he wants to make uh, a musical, and Burt Reynolds, who's not a uh, who's not really a singer. So all these directors, they all start churning out these big bombs and the studios start taking back control over uh, these movies. And they don't, they, don't all, they don't all come out like in one year. They're spread out over a period of four or five years, something like that. But this is indicative of the problems going on in Hollywood after th this wonderful Film school generation made these made these wonderful movies. So sticking with Spielberg for a little while, this is when he really came to the forefront. We have Jaws from 1975, and it's based on a book. And I probably don't need to tell you a lot of movie, uh, a lot of movies and movie franchises are based on books. Uh, whether it's the James Bond movies, which used to be based on books. They ran out of books uh, after about 13 or so. Uh, Harry Potter books, Lord of the Rings books, Twilight 
uh, books um, and uh, uh, Hunger Games books. Lots and lots of movies are based on books and the plus side of that is you have a built-in audience. All the people that read the book are probably going to want to see the film. How did, you know, who are they going to get to play Katniss? And who are they going to get to play Harry? And all that kind of thing. So there's a kind of a built-in audience. Usually it's a pretty good idea. Um, uh, comics are kind of like that. Comics are kind of like that. Marvel and DC and all that kind of stuff are kind of like that. But books are a little bit different. Um, and a, a, usually a much a bigger audience than for comic books until more recently. So Jaws, uh, about a shark uh, on the uh, uh, attacking people uh, near an island. The island is Amity, and it's a fictitious island uh, on, the, in the east, on the east coast there somewhere uh, near, um, like, uh, near Long Island or, uh, or somewhere around in there, Connecticut, New York, uh, around in there. And uh, I love this picture because there's this mechanical shark and, uh, you know, you can't really train sharks. So, uh, and, you know, maybe you can get some actual sharks in the wild, but you can't get them, you know, attacking people and things like that. You can get them just swimming, but uh, you can't really do that with sharks. So they decide they, they're going to have to build a mechanical one. And this is before CGI, of course, 1975. This is a good 25 years, um, 30 years before they could get really good CGI to do this kind of stuff. And they build it in California in a freshwater tank. And now they're out on the ocean, which is salt water. Apparently that was part of the problem uh, as well. But the shark just didn't really work very well. And it would, it would just lock up or, or uh, seize up or whatever. And the actors would be sitting around in their trailers or playing cards or whatever. And they'd hear on the walkie-talkies, the shark is working, the shark is working. Everyone to the set, everyone to the set. So, uh, just, as, just as it says, the editor, Verna Fields, uh, and by the way, I have to insert here, a, a lot of top Hollywood editors are females. Uh, they are having... Uh, a, a hard time breaking into the directing branch, and um, but uh, as editors, and they're also having a hard time breaking into cinematography too. I don't know why it's such a, a boys club uh, with cinematography and with uh, with directing. Uh, Hollywood, uh, like society at large, does have certain places where. Uh, they would be, you know, women's jobs, makeup, hair, set design, things like that. Those would be deemed women's jobs on a set. But the guys' jobs, you know, carrying those heavy lights and carrying those cameras and tripods and all that kind of stuff, that uh, is deemed men's work. Uh, th there's no reason that th that should be the way it is. Women are just as capable of, of men as doing all this kind of stuff. Uh, as men are doing all this stuff, but uh, women, for various reasons, going all the way back to the silent era, have had a pretty have had pretty good luck in the editing side of things. And uh, so, like I say, going back from the silent era up to the present, uh, a lot of directors, uh, Quentin Tarantino, uh, Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, have often worked with uh, with female uh, editors. So um, that is a, that is a place where they where they seem to be doing pretty well, uh, but uh, still a lot of work to be done in in directing and some of the other branches. So anyway, Verna cut most of the shark out of the movie, and at, with Spielberg was there, you know, sort of deciding. And uh, film is twenty four frames per second. Mostly now it's digital, but uh, and they have ways of, of approximating uh, frames to uh, digital. But uh, back then it would be literally film. And so they're cutting the shark frame practically frame by frame. One second is 24 frames, so they're putting in 8 frames, 10 frames, 12 frames, 16 frames. Just quick cuts of the shark. And... 
I've been telling students for a long time that they just about cut the shark out of the movie and a couple years ago I thought maybe I should check this out and let's get some numbers on this and I, I put the DVD in and uh, and uh, started uh, started my stopwatch and came up with about two minutes and 20 some seconds 22 maybe seconds of screen time for the shark so it's a two-hour movie about a shark and the shark is in the movie about two minutes and 22 seconds we don't even see the shark for the first hour of the film and not much other than that so uh, I've linked to some uh, pretty good uh, pretty good stuff there with Jaws there's the very first attack no shark whatsoever it's uh, it's after it's during a party uh, young people on, on a beach having a having a bonfire and drinking and all that sort of thing and a, and a girl and a guy decide to go for a dip that's the first attack no shark whatsoever uh, and it's horrific it's totally horrific right because we see the girl um, young lady woman I don't I hate to call a 20 year old a girl but we see the the, the woman there uh, treading water and all of a sudden she gasps and gets pulled under and she's screaming and all that it's it's really uh, scary and and shocking and no shark whatsoever and then uh, we have the second attack on a uh, on the beach near the 4th of July weekend and it's crowded full of people lots of people in the water and our central character is the new uh, is the new sheriff or police chief in town and he's from a he's from a, a, a city I think he's from Philadelphia and he's sort of taken this job it's supposed to be kind of an easy job and he's very very nervous he doesn't really even like the water very much and it's a wonderful scene um, and there's some nice stuff that Spielberg does. So I want to kind of walk you through it, and then uh, I want you to uh, stop this uh, uh, stop this part and go and watch the shark attack and then come back to this. That's what I'd be doing in class. Um, I didn't really want to do it. Like, I, I probably could have done something like that, uh, but these are going to get posted uh, to YouTube, and I wanted them to be just, kind of all together, about an hour or so all together, so I didn't want to chop them all up too much. But you can do that quite easily. Just, you know, hit the pause and go to the next one and then come back. Anyway, what you will see is that, that uh, Spielberg's going to put the camera pretty low to the ground, and that is how the audience is going to see it, uh, those of us in the audience. So it's almost like our feet are in the sand or our feet are in the water, so we're going to feel real low. He's not going to give us any high angles so that we can sort of get a bird's eye view of this attack. He's going to introduce us to the two victims, Pippet the dog and Alex the boy. And we're going to meet them very, uh, very quickly and very briefly. You have to meet your victims in a horror movie or slasher movie or thriller movie. You got to meet your victims even briefly. And uh, we're also going to see lots of yellow sprinkled out throughout the, the beach scene with, uh, with uh, blankets and hats and picnic baskets and uh, uh, inflatable rafts, all this stuff. Lots of yellow around. Yellow is kind of an up color. It's an it's a active color, a very high energy color. So Spielberg's going to have lots of yellow throughout that scene. Also, our, uh, ch our police chief is going to be watching the movie and or watching the ocean and that's kind of us right he's the outsider from the island and we are kind of outsiders from the island we're the audience and we're going to kind of see the movie through his eyes and people keep walking in front of him and that means walking in front of the camera or in front of the camera lens so our view is going to keep getting blocked and uh, and that creates a little bit of tension. What we can't see, right? That's that's. Well, if you can't see something, it's like uh, it's like the dark, right? What's under the bed, or what's in the closet, or what's in the in the forest, right? What's what's out there lurking in the what that we can't see, and what we can't see is always going to be very very scary. Now this is a 
bright sunny day, but we're still going to have our view blocked by people keep walking in front of the camera on purpose, of course. Uh, and uh, a, a number of them is going to be yellow. It almost almost like Spielberg told a couple of people wearing a yellow raincoat walk in front of the camera. It's it's kind of close and 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 blurry and out of focus, but we're going to get that. And uh, then. Uh, we are uh, going to get a false alarm. So we got to have a false alarm. That's really a, a good thing uh, in, in horror movies. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real trope, the false alarm. A girl's going to scream, and, he, and our sheriff, our, our police chief, he's going he's gonna to sit up and look out, and, oh, my God, what's going on? And, and it's just a girl and a guy playing out in the water. He's got her uh, on his shoulders, and he's walking around with her on her shoulder. So we get that scream and then what's going to happen is John Williams and his wonderful music dun 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 he's going to get that wonderful bass line of music and basically the camera. We're not going to see the shark. We're going to have a camera and we're going to see through the shark's eyes. So POV point of view. Point of view. And we're going to get the point of view of the shark. And we already saw a shark POV in the very first opening uh, scene with, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, uh, with the young lady out in the water, Chrissy, out in the water. So we, we already know that when we get that POV shot, we're seeing through the shark's eyes. So the music and the POV, and we have the shark and we are not going to see the shark again in this scene. We're going to see a bit of a fin, but it's not that whole big shark, mechanical shark thing. So first two attacks, no shark whatsoever. And it's going to be uh, uh, quite shocking. Poor little Alex. Uh, we're going to get the POV and then the camera, basically, is going to swim up to uh, Alex. Alex's feet uh, kicking the water uh, on the inflatable yellow raft there. Maybe the shark thinks it's a seal or something like that, and he's looking for dinner. And uh, and then uh, we're going to have panic and so on on the beach, and everybody's going to come in into the beach, It's and the one uh, woman, Alex's mother, is uh, it's just heartbreaking to see her. Um, everybody else has gotten their, their, their loved ones, their children, and all that. And then Spielberg's going to show uh, the, the uh, water lapping on the beach, and it's going to be red, right, blood red. Um, and so a couple of things. I, I've seen this so many times. There's a couple of things that I, that I can't help but notice. One of them is Alex, he, he can't even be 100 pounds. He's just this skinny little 10-year-old, something like that. There's no way that him being attacked uh, 50 yards out in the water, uh, that the blood is going to wash up ashore. But that's okay. That's okay. It's 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 uh, it's it's kind of um, uh, poetry there, right? It's the sort of thing that you get to do, right? It doesn't have to make any sense, but you can you can do that, and it, and it does work for Spielberg. The other thing is the the depth of the ocean keeps changing. Uh, a the 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 young boy and the girl. He's standing on the on the bottom with her on his shoulders, so uh, the water isn't very deep. Even forty or fifty yards out, it's not much deeper than uh, than uh, waist deep. Uh, but then we're going to see through the shark's eyes that the ocean is suddenly uh, at twenty or twenty five feet deep, so that the shark can swim around and all that. And that's okay. That's okay, right? We're not going to overthink this. Uh, that's what you do when you're when you're making a making a film. So uh, Spielberg, uh, he wanted to shoot on the actual ocean. The people at the studio said, "We can build you a whole big ocean tank uh, at the studio. You can have control over uh, the lighting. If you need to shoot around sunset, we can control the lighting, and we can make our own waves and all that." And Spielberg said, "No, no, no, no. It's going to look fake. It's got to be on the real ocean." So he insisted that they move the whole crew out to the ocean, and the big mechanical thing 
out there as well, and it was just a real nightmare for poor Stephen. But uh, like I said, he's a good filmmaker, and all of his instincts were really true and right on where, from where to put the camera and bl blocking the view and John Williams, all that stuff, right? He really made lemonade out of these lemons. He wasn't dealt a very good hand, and he really did this amazing movie, and it's incredibly tense. Now today, we have CGI, and, you know, we could have the shark you know, waking up and making a cup of coffee and, you know, you can do anything with CGI. We don't have to fill in any gaps. Uh, I, I always pair the, the shark with the alien from Alien because the alien in Alien is only on screen uh, about to say about two minutes or so, even a little bit less. Um, and uh, so Ridley Scott had to do lots of fast cutting and things like that, just like Spielberg did. They're both very smart filmmakers. Now today they could have the alien and the shark and they could be doing anything with CGI. And our imaginations are the really the best, the best filmmakers, right? Are our imaginations. We can imagine things much scary and much scarier and more horrific uh, in our own mind's eye. And I think uh, in large part that's what made the movie so, so uh, uh, fantastic. Okay, so we talked about the art of Jaws, but uh, really the main reason that we're talking about Jaws is the business side of things. So the studio was very nervous, and normally movies, this is the original, I think this is on the book, uh, the book cover and one of the original posters is just wonderful. Uh, and uh, Normally, movies in this era, the big movies would be released in the fall, uh, in the winter, or maybe in the spring, but big movies didn't tend to come out in the summer. Summer was drive-in movie time, cheap, whatever. They weren't all black and white by the mid-70s, but you know they weren't the big, important Oscar movies in, uh, in, uh, in the summertime. But the movie is, uh, the book and the movie is set in the summer, and the studio thought it would be a good time to release the movie sometime in June or July, I think it was. And they started getting very nervous about the shark, the mechanical shark, and it just not working very well. So they decide they are going to do a wide release, a wide release. Hundreds of theater, well, maybe a hundred theaters. Today it would be thousands of theaters. It's a big movie. Uh, like a Star Wars movie or a Marvel movie could be maybe 4,000 screens. And, of course, we have to remember that a lot of theaters have multiple screens. Back in the 1970s, usually it was one theater with one screen, and each theater held uh, a lot more people, hundreds if not uh, a thousand seats. Now we have much... Uh, uh, much smaller theaters, multiplexes, all that kind of stuff, 20, 30 screens under one roof. So it get, gets a little complicated. Normally they talk about screens versus theaters. Anyway, movies would be limited, or what they call limited or platform release. Big cities, New York, L.A., Chicago, something like that. And then hopefully the word would get out that it's a good movie and the press would have screenings and the press would have critics would see it and it would get reviewed and they could do lots of marketing and all that kind of stuff uh, building word for the movie and that's how most of the big movies uh, went uh, back then right, right all the all the big movies Godfather all those kinds of movies that's how they went but the studio is uh, universal is thinking oh my god we've got a turkey on our hands we will advertise the heck out of this thing, and will advertise on TV, which normally you wouldn't do if it's only playing in a couple of theaters, uh, but they have a big national ad campaign, newspapers, magazines, billboards, all that, uh, and they will, and they're, it's kind of cynical, I have to say, it's kind of cynical. We need to get as many people in to see this movie on the opening weekend before everybody finds out that it's a turkey, basically, right? And, and, this is the way movies have been ever since. 
Okay, ever since Jaws, the whole uh, the whole emphasis is on the opening weekend. Okay, opening weekend, wide summer releases. A lot of the biggest movies come out in the summer, although summer has sort of expanded to uh, late April and May in in many instances. And for some reason, August isn't really part of summer. Summer uh, for the movie business is uh, May through July, uh, basically, even though school uh, doesn't really get out until June for a lot of uh, high school kids and so on and, and uh, so on. But anyway, summer, May through July, big movies, wide releases. You know all the movies I'm talking about, whether it's a Fast and Furious movie or a Marvel movie or a James Bond movie or whatever. A lot of them come out in the summer, and the other big time is around Christmas time. And Christmas time, Christmas vacation, all that kind of thing. That would be the other time when the big movies, Star Wars movies, have been coming out at Christmas time, and other movies, James Bond movies, have been coming out uh, at the in the fall. So, so uh, summer and fall, and wide, wide, wide releases. And all those lessons were learned from Jaws, right? All those lessons were learned from Jaws. Wide release, get everybody in on opening weekend. Half the time you don't know if the movie's any good or not. Thanks to social media, word can get out pretty fast. Uh, and uh, so speaking of social media, sometimes the if it's, a, if it's got really good word of mouth, then attendance will really jump from Friday night to Saturday night, even even within the opening weekend. And if the movie is getting poor word of mouth, then attendance uh, will stay flat. Normally it goes from Friday to Saturday. It goes up. More people go on Saturday than Friday. But if it's got poor word of mouth, thanks to the really fast uh, social media that's out there, then the movie might even drop. Uh, attendance from Friday to Saturday or remain flat. But anyway, opening weekend, still a big thing. And on Sunday afternoon, most news feeds will have the top 10 box office from the previous weekend. They can estimate uh, from Friday and Saturday and they have their formulas and they can usually figure out uh, what the Sunday box office is going to be. Usually it's a little bit of, a, of, a, of an estimate. Uh, and sometimes they revise those. Sometimes it's like a tie, and, and one movie looks like it's going to be in another movie out, and then after the true figures come in on Monday. But anyway, um, that opening weekend, it's a big thing, and we see that all in our, uh, all in our news feeds and the, and the press and the papers and all of that. Star Wars, 1977. George Lucas, another one of the film school guys, and this film is going to take all of the lessons learned from Jaws and increase all those. Uh, Jaws did pretty well with t-shirts and things like that and, and, uh, and the soundtrack and, uh, and, and a few things like that. And Star Wars is gonna, just going to take all that, uh, action figures and and uh, soundtracks and all that, and that is how they're going to make lots and lots of money, right? Not just from the box office. That's the whole point. There are other ways to make money from a film than just paid attendance at the box office. And Lucas, pretty cagey guy, even when he was a young guy in his 20s, uh, he sold the rights to Star Wars uh, and kept the, the, all the licensing and the, and the rights and everything to the toys. He's actually made more money off of the toys and things, uh, the merchandise, than the studio made off of the film. And that allowed uh, George Lucas to self-fund the rest of his portion of the Star Wars movies, the next five Star Wars movies. He could... Uh, fund those, produce them, fund them, and only use the studio for marketing purposes. They, the studios are still pretty important when it comes to marketing, uh, distribution, getting the film out there, booking it into theaters, uh, uh, booking uh, the stars onto the talk shows to promote the movie, 
uh, on the Today Show or on the Tonight Show, whatever. Uh, and the studio is still really good at that. The studio is really good. But, you know, filmmakers uh, know the art and they know the lights and the, and, the, and the cameras and the editing, all that kind of stuff. But the whole marketing thing is still done by the studios. So uh, Lucas doesn't market the movies, but he had been, had been able to, uh, to uh, self-finance all those movies ever since. So diving deep into the business side of all of that, and that is the, uh, that's the Disney, you probably could figure that out, that's the Disney uh, corporate headquarters in, uh, in Burbank, D23. Uh, that actually references, if, if you've heard of that, that references uh, 1923 when Walt Disney incorporated uh, the, the company. And there are the Seven Dwarves, and so revenue streams become a big thing. Going back again, it had been around for a while. Uh, if there was a, a musical, especially something like The Sound of Music, which was a big, big hit, then the soundtrack album was going to sell a lot. But normally there wouldn't be much else after the soundtrack album for musicals, uh, Grease, uh, movies like that, Saturday Night Fever, uh, then that would be it. And Disney in particular, but a, a lot of the other companies, they figured out pretty fast. Video games, toys, books, all that stuff that they got from George Lucas, making those little Star Wars toys and everything. There's a lot of money in that. Really, more money in some cases than the, than the film itself. Uh, now, a little bit of a side point on Star Wars and the toys. Star Wars came out in May of uh, uh, 1977. And believe it or not, there weren't enough toys on the shelves for that Christmas, uh, whatever that is, uh, six months later, six, yeah, six months later, uh, they need a much longer lead time for the toys, uh, making them in Korea or Taiwan or China or somewhere like that. And um, it was, nobody figured it was going to be such a huge hit. Lots of little kids uh, got uh, uh, sort of like a, an IOU or a, or a um, uh, little card saying this entitles you to a uh, Luke Skywalker, whatever, action figure, uh, whenever we get them made, okay? And uh, so they uh, learned that lesson too. That never happened again, but uh, they probably lost out on quite a few toy sales if the toy store shelves had been full that December, they probably would have sold more. Um, but uh, uh, it, it still worked out okay, and, and, and kids got uh, toys eventually. And uh, the studios started seeing that these revenue streams, here comes a stream of soundtrack albums and another stream of, of later on video games, toys, books, lunch boxes, uh, all that. Right? All that, all those streams are going to pour into the river. And that giant river of Star Wars, Marvel, whatever, Fast and Furious, James Bond, Harry Potter, all those, all those different ways of making money. And the studios are going to start to become uh, kind of valuable property. They, they had a long period of decline from uh, when we talked about earlier, the fall of the studio system. Going back to the late 40s, this long, slow, steady uh, decline. It didn't look like they were worth much of anything. All they did was they made movies and put them in theaters, and that was it. And if you can't make money off of the movie in the theater, then that, that's it. Then the movie's not doing any good anymore. And over the years, they start seeing that movies can be shown on television again, so they can start selling them to television. Then uh, cable comes along. Then VHS comes along, and then DVDs come along, and streaming comes along, and they see that all these wonderful uh, films, Gone with the Wind, and Casablanca, and all that stuff, and, and uh, Snow White, uh, their lives are not over. Their lives are not over. They can uh, come back and come back and come back and generate more money and more money 
and more money. But it used to be once the movie was out of theaters, then then it would just go in storage, and that would be that. Nobody would think that a movie could generate any more money. But over the years, uh, like I say, with TV, cable TV, home video, basically the whole the, the, the umbrella term is home video, DVD, streaming cable, and a lot of money to be made. So these studios start to be valuable properties. They start getting gobbled up by bigger and bigger conglomerates. Now, in the 1970s, Disney was pretty much at a low ebb. They, they were not the hot company in the 1970s or the 1980s, but they got some, some very aggressive uh, management uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, and they started uh, turning out more and more valuable uh, types of movies. They went real big for musicals uh, in the 80s and 90s with Aladdin and The Lion King and and uh, Beauty and the Beast and uh, The Little Mermaid, all that, right? So they, they sort of got this nice rebound. But today, Disney is the big company by a long shot. They are the big company by a long shot. And, and as, as you may or may not have heard, they have swallowed up Lucasfilm with all the Star Wars movies. They've swallowed up Marvel with most of the Marvel stuff except for Spider-Man. Uh, and they have swallowed up the Muppets, Pixar. They've swallowed up a lot of stuff. So consolidation by the studios. Now other uh, studios have, have been part of that as well. But Disney is really the, uh, the, the uh, example. Disney is by far the big example. And so, lesson learned, importance of opening weekend. If the second weekend drops more than 50%, that is not a good sign. And some of these big movies open up to $100 million on the opening weekend at the box office, or even more. We're talking about the, the, the Star Wars movies, the, the James Bond, Fast and Furious, Marvel, all that stuff. They cost... 200, 250 to 300 million dollars to make and opening weekend it might make a hundred million dollars second weekend 50 million dollars third weekend 25 12 and a half etc six half 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 but if a movie opens up at a hundred million dollars and on the second weekend it makes maybe 30 million dollars Okay, much less than half, much less than 50%, then word is getting out that this is not a really good movie. And there have been some, some big budget flops, John Carter and some movies like that. They open up big. Uh, Hulk, actually, some other movies like that. They open up real big, and then they drop more than 50% on the second weekend. So that is a problem. Oop, that seems to be backwards. Okay. Second weekend drop, and there we go. Multiples, how much a movie makes from its opening weekend as a total of its entire theatrical run. And like I said, a lot of movies make half of their total box office on the opening weekend, $100 million. Okay, then half that, 50, then half of that, 25, and so on. And so half on the opening weekend and the other half on the next five weekends, and then that's it. And then it's gone, right? That's kind of the way the business runs. That's the way the business runs. Big upfront, big opening weekend, and half, 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 half for about a month or so, and then, then it's pretty much done. Platforms is the business term for how you put your product out there. Okay, think of it like that. Do you put it out in a theater? Do you put it out on TV? Do you put it out in a game? Do you put it out on the internet? Okay, or streaming. So those are called platforms. Those are called platforms. Okay, there we are at the new Star Wars uh, uh, land at Disneyland. Uh, what is it? Galaxy's Edge, I think it's called. Synergy is the term that Disney has been so successful having all parts of its theme parks working together. 
or of its corporations, of its corporations working together. So the theme parks are going to help out the movie studio, the TV studio is going to help out, uh, the radio network is going to help out, cruise lines, streaming, they're all going to help promote the same product, okay, what we see on the screen and the characters parading through Disneyland. Franchise, we've talked about this, I believe, back with James Bond movies, and a franchise is a film that can generate sequels, okay, and that's a business term, McDonald's are franchises, and basically you just put your money up, okay, McDonald's helps you find the location, they take care of all the recipes, they take care of all the advertising, and the workflow and all that, and it's kind of guaranteed to make money for uh, the investors, the franchisers, and so that term has uh, migrated to films, right? Some of these films are like a franchise, guaranteed to make money. Every Star Wars movie, Marvel movie, Pixar movie, well, not Pixar, Pixar's aren't franchise, but uh, 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 Wizarding World, Harry Potter type movies, right? They are all franchises uh, going back to James Bond or thereabouts. Back end is profit sharing with the actors, getting some money on the back end, not up front, not up front, here's your salary, okay, but sharing in the profits, sharing in the profits, and that's getting a piece of the back end, and if you are a big actor, if you are a Leo or a Brad or a Sandra or a Merrill, okay, you probably are going to get profit sharing. And by the way, uh, in the Marvel world, Robert Downey Jr. was the only one that got a piece of the back end. Not None of the Chris's did uh, or anybody else, but uh, Robert Downey Jr. was the only one that, uh, that was part of the profit sharing in all of that. Reboot is starting all over, pretending that all that earlier stuff didn't even exist. Okay, uh, this is the James Bond. He looks like Daniel Craig. He doesn't look like Sean Connery. Uh, this is Batman. Uh, this is Spider-Man, Superman. Okay, they have all been rebooted. And it is a weird feeling when your favorite franchise is rebooted. At some point, the studios are going to take your favorite intellectual property. There will be a new Star-Lord. There will be a new... Iron Man. It won't be Robert Downey Jr. It'll be a new Iron Man. Uh, might even be a, a, a female or a person of color, and it's going to be kind of weird because you grew up on Robert Downey Jr. You grew up on Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth, Chris Pine, Chris Pratt. Those are the ones that you know, the four holy Chrises. And here's this new person. And or somebody older like me, or possibly your parents or grandparents. I grew up on Sean Connery as James Bond. And then here comes another Bond and another and another. Uh, so it will happen. It feels kind of weird. Uh, I would say my insight, if, there's, if there is insight in all this, is uh, your first love, okay, your first one when you are young, when you're a teenager and in your 20s, and that's the stuff that's going to really imprint itself on you for the rest of your life. So the music that you listen to, as a teenager or 20-something, the actors that play the heroes in your movies and so on uh, are going to have a real strong impact on you. Uh, and, you know, I grew up, I loved classic rock, Beatles, Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, all that stuff made a strong impact on me. I listen to music today, I listen to the modern stuff, but, you know, the stuff that you first fall in love with back when you're a teenager, that's the stuff, James Bond, Sean Connery, and so on. So uh, at some point in 20 or 30 years, you'll be an old fart just like me saying, who's this new Iron Man? Who's this new Potter? That's not the one that I grew up on, right? You get to be an old codger like me uh, bemoaning that uh, whoever's playing the new whatever uh, isn't, uh, isn't quite right. 70% of Hollywood 
film revenue comes from overseas. I love this poster. I have no idea what language this is. And I always ask my students, because I usually have uh, foreign nationals in my class, uh, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, Korean, whatever, Vietnamese. I usually have uh, students, but no one has ever been able to tell me what this is. So I, I have no idea uh, what this language is. Maybe it's Korean. I don't know. I thought Korean was a little bit more boxy like this as opposed to Chinese. So uh, maybe, it, maybe it's Korean. Maybe I just haven't had any Korean students in my class. I don't know. Anyway, 70% of Hollywood revenue comes from overseas. That is a big deal. And movies, uh, that means only 30% comes from the U.S. So movies are big movies, big expensive movies, not little comedies and stuff. But the big action movies, the franchise movies, are going to be geared to a world audience, not geared specifically to an American audience. We're still the biggest part of the world. We're almost equaled by China. We'll see how that uh, works out. But um, uh, so much of it comes from overseas. And by the way, I, and I think I mentioned this with, uh, with James Bond, uh, China is such a big audience, and, and Russia is a pretty good sized audience and so on, that they probably won't be bad guys in like James Bond movies or Fast and Furious movies or Jason Bourne movies or, or whatever. Um, it's easy to have a bad guy uh, who's uh, a business person, businessman, businesswoman, a drug dealer or something like that. But I think gone are the days of the, of, uh, of the James Bond movies when uh, the Russians or the Chinese were the bad guys. I don't think we're going to see that anymore. Action movies are the easiest to market to foreign audiences. Uh, you probably could have figured that out. Uh, you know, chasing and fighting, chasing and fighting. Uh, I have to say that most foreign films in the U.S. are subtitled. Most foreign films in the U.S. are subtitled. They're smaller films. Even the movie that won the Best Picture, uh, uh, a Parasite, was subtitled. But all of the big movies, all of the Star Wars movies, and all of the uh, uh, James Bond movies and Fast and Furious movies, they are all, they are all dubbed. They are all dubbed. Foreign audiences don't read uh, subtitles. They have actors. They match the voices with Brad or Leo or Chris, and they do a pretty darn good job of it in most cases, and you almost would swear that it was made in your own language. And my experience with that is uh, my wife is Thai. Uh, we met in Thailand. I got married in Thailand and visit Thailand, and I, uh, or we saw... King Kong a few years ago, uh, the Peter Jackson movie. I had already seen it here in the U.S. and I went over, we went over around uh, Christmas, New Year's, and the English language version wasn't going to be showing for a while, so we said, ah, what the heck, let's, let's just see it in Thai. And the dubbing was amazing. Uh, uh, the Naomi Watts uh, character, the girl, it, it her the, it's almost like Naomi Watts learned how to speak Thai. It sounded just like Naomi Watts. It was really something. Uh, whoever the Thai person that they got to do Jack Black wasn't quite, wasn't quite there, but uh, definitely uh, Naomi Watts. Studios have fought TV. They fought home video. They uh, fought streaming. Um, big... Uh, music companies have fought files and file sharing and all that kind of stuff. They really aren't at the head of uh, new technology and so on. They're usually the kind of following rather than leading. Um, so that's history, right? We could learn from history, uh, new technology. Um, I, I can't say that movie studios would still be shooting black and white silent like they did with Charlie Chaplin days, but every time a new technology comes out, it is disruptive. Sound was disruptive. They had to put speakers and everything in all the theaters. Color was disruptive. It cost a lot more money to process color film and so on. VHS was disruptive and so on. So it's, uh, they, they fight all of these new developments hand over fist. So 
So, moving off from Steven Spielberg and Jaws, let's stick with Spielberg here for a little while longer. And I want to mention that he began in television. Yes, he began in television, directed some television uh, movies. They call them made-for-TV movies. He had uh, an internship when he was in college. He was at uh, Cal State Long Beach for a little while. He didn't graduate from there until just a few years ago, actually. And after his internship was over, apparently he just kept showing up, showing up at the studio, and the, the guard at the gate recognized him, and, and he got to go in and found an empty office and set up shop, and <laughs> pretty amazing story. He's told the story. It's not a secret. And over the years, he has had this very enviable ability to do big budget popcorn movies, and popcorn movies sell lots of popcorn. And the kinds of movies that sell lots of popcorn are action movies, and certainly big budget movies for sure. So th they have kind of this generic term, popcorn movies. And there are some of Spielberg's big popcorn movies, Close Encounters, Indiana Jones, a bunch of those, uh, and uh, Jurassic Park, a couple of those. And he has managed to, to not quite one for them and one for me, as he calls it. Other directors call that call it that too. They one for the studios and then one personal film for themselves. But Spielberg making personal films for himself, more or less, those are the movies that are going to win the Oscars, like Schindler's List, about the Holocaust, Saving Private Ryan, which actually was a pretty good sized hit. Lincoln, Bridge of Spies, Color Purple, Amistad, movies like that. And that's a pretty enviable career. I have linked to uh, Saving Private Ryan. The opening sequence is uh, just amazing. It's the, it's the landing of the, uh, the Allied forces on the beaches of Normandy in uh, northern France. And uh, it, it's, it's a, 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 just an amazing piece of filmmaking. It really is. It's justifiably famous. And I think most of it, uh, luckily on, uh, on YouTube, most of it is there. While you're looking at it, uh, I'd like you to notice a couple of things. It is not quite in black and white, but Spielberg and his editors have drained most of the color. They've taken a lot of the saturation. They've drained most of the color out, so it kind of looks like uh, a World War II era, almost like a black and white movie. It's not exactly black and white but almost at the very beginning, we are going to get a uh, framing device and we're gonna have an old man walking through a cemetery with his family. And as becomes apparent, we're, you know, we see an American flag and then we see a French flag and we figure out you know, where he is. And when he sees the grave marker, he's gonna break down and be down on his knees and sobbing and we're never going to see who is buried there, and that is our mystery. And that's what frame, framing devices do often. They set up kind of a mystery to pull the audience in. Gee, I wonder who's buried there. We can't even tell who the old guy is. It's not uh, Tom Hanks or Matt Damon or anybody like that in old age makeup. So we really don't know who uh, the, the guy is that's there. And uh, we're, we're going to come in on his eyes, and uh, we're going to kind of see what he's thinking about. He, his, his mind is going to go racing back to D-Day. But importantly, we are not going to cut to another pair of eyes. Uh, and if we cut from an old man's eyes to a young guy's eyes, then that's the same guy. That's how it works. That's, that's kind of the rule. If you cut to an old guy and a young guy close up on their eyes, then that's who that is. But Spielberg doesn't do that. He cuts to the ocean uh, and waves and boats and things like that. And then we come in on Tom Hanks's uh, craft. So uh, a really, a wonderful scene. Enjoy it. And then come back. And we're going to transition to Vietnam War films. There's Stanley Kubrick working on Full Metal Jacket in suburban London. 
Yes, he's there in suburban London. So the war, for the most part, it was a little bit before 16, but for the most part, we started uh, ramping up our uh, troops. 1965, Lyndon Johnson, and we're pretty much out by 73. And most of these movies are going to be in the late 70s and 80s. So they are not done during the war itself. It is one of those things where you kind of need to step back and get a little bit of a perspective over all of that. None were filmed in Vietnam. We are going to get a little bit of realism versus expressionism. Okay, so realistic type movies, you can do that in a documentary. Okay, but these movies are going to exaggerate in order to make a point. There are some great documentaries. Ken Burns has made a really wonderful documentary on the Vietnam War, but these are going to be a little out there, a little uh, darker, satirical uh, in uh, Apocalypse Now. There's going to be surfing and, and uh, during, during a battle. So... Uh, that's kind of the difference. The, the, the World War II movies are going to be much more, uh, oftentimes more patriotic, more straightforward, uh, uh, heroes, villains, all that. And when we go off to Vietnam, because the war was also divisive, it wasn't quite as unanimous as World War II was. Lots and lots of people, when after, the day after the, uh, the bombing at Pearl Harbor, there were lines around the block. At, uh, at, at recruiting stations and things of, of young men volunteering to go serve. Uh, but with Vietnam, people were, people were trying to avoid the draft. They were staying in college and getting student deferments and all sorts of other things. So just like the wars, the films that were made about those wars reflect, uh, reflect those realities. Okay, so like I say, uh, struggle with authority in the Vietnam War movies, uh, uh, when Francis Coppola was shooting Apocalypse Now, most of the people he talked to said it was a nightmare, and so he made it kind of like a nightmare, kind of kind of dreamlike, almost like a nightmare. So Full Metal Jacket, uh, very interesting. Uh, they found a cement factory that was going to be torn down for housing and got the use of it and they brought in uh, bulldozers and things and knocked over some walls and then they brought in uh, some palm trees and things like that and they put up some stuff in Vietnamese and in French since it was a French colony for so long. Part of the Vietnam War was shot uh, or took place in cities uh, during the Tet Offensive of, uh, of 1968 in uh, in Hue in particular, and in Saigon, there was a lot of fighting in cities, uh, house to house, street to street, the sort of thing that we think of in World War II, working their way through various uh, 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 French and, and Belgian cities and things like that. And so Kubrick shot Full Metal Jacket uh, just outside of London, got a couple of uh, nice Links there, we start off in uh, basic training, and about the first uh, chunk of the movie, maybe 20-30% of the movie, takes place in basic training. And then off to Vietnam we go, and uh, watch those, uh, watch those uh, segments and enjoy them. It's a great movie, you might choose to watch it. Uh, one of the, the, the drill sergeant, he does a great job, and uh, he and Kubrick worked very closely together. He, the drill sergeant was a real drill sergeant, Lee Ermey, and he came up with eight pages of taunts and threats to new troops. And he and Kubrick, they, they, trans, uh, they transcribed it all and got it all down and worked it down. Uh, and one of the uh, uh, troop members, he's going he's gonna to call him Private Pyle. And that's a reference to this guy who was on TV. Gomer Pyle, USMC, and he was sort of a hillbilly kind of a guy, so that's Private Pyle. So, Apocalypse Now, 1979. This is much more expressionistic, not particularly realistic, 
Francis Coppola. Uh, I've got uh, a couple of clips relating to a air attack, cavalry, the air cav, as they called it, and they uh, would uh, you know blow the reveille and off they would go. But in this movie, they're going to be um, uh, playing music, the ride of the Valkyries out of some large speakers underneath this helicopter. I don't know that that has ever happened. Uh, helicopters are very, very loud. I don't, I have no way of knowing, but I highly doubt that anybody could hear music played from a helicopter in another helicopter, but it's in the movie. It's kind of cool. And we're going to get some wonderful battles there from, uh, from Apocalypse Now. Um, and there are some scenes with Marlon Brando. We know Brando going back to um, The Wild One and, uh, uh, and The Godfather, and he is in this film as well. So, Apocalypse Now, enjoy that. Uh, Coppola coming off a pretty good decade there with Godfather Part 1, Part 2, and Apocalypse Now. So, Vietnam War films mostly are done years after the war, the, the actual war somewhere, 65 to 73, and here we see Deer Hunter coming home, Go Tell the Spartans, Platoon, Good Morning Vietnam. They were all done years after the war. Apocalypse Now and Star Wars are examples of the new emphasis on sound design in movies. There is some wonderful sound mixing there. Uh, is Ben Burt, a legendary sound designer, and he is mixing the air cav attack on the beach there from Apocalypse Now. There are the helicopters coming ashore, and... Lucas developed his THX sound system for theaters because he didn't think the sound was good enough for his Star Wars movies. So that's an important part of what is going on at that point. Spike Lee, an African-American director, and often themes of race and being black in America. There he is from last year with his Oscar win. Always a very flashy dresser. I love the way Spike dresses. He looks fantastic. Do the Right Thing, School Days, Jungle Fever, Malcolm X, Chirac. So Do the Right Thing, that's the film that put him on the map. And I have the trailer for Do the Right Thing from uh, back, in, uh, back in the 80s. And his latest film, Black Klansman, and those three Ks there are on purpose. And that is where he got his first directing and Best Picture Oscar nominations. And our last director of the day, kind of a long day. You've been able to pause and stop and take breaks, I know. But uh, Martin Scorsese. Definitely from the film school generation, he went to NYU. He actually taught there for a while. He often has themes of, uh, or his films take place in New York, often in the gangster underworld. Not always. Uh, Raging Bull isn't in the gangster underworld, but uh, a lot of his movies, including his latest, The Irishman, and the one where he finally won his coveted Best Director Oscar, are all set in uh, the, the Underworld Casino in Las Vegas. Um, the Departed is the one where he finally got his, his uh, coveted uh, Best uh, Directing Oscar. These are the films with Robert De Niro. Great stuff from Goodfellas. That's probably still really his best film. That's the one where he really got robbed. He really should have won his Oscar for Goodfellas. But over the years, uh, when we talk about perspective, uh, time has been very kind to Goodfellas and to Scorsese. Right? Sometimes we talk about standing the test of time. And 
Goodfellas has definitely stood the test of time. Some great scenes from that, a wonderful tracking shot, some wonderful uh, Steadicam stuff in Goodfellas. It's a good way to put the audience kind of in the movie. It's not sort of like we're tra trailing along with uh, Ray Liotta's character taking his date through the back door and through the kitchen of the nightclub and getting seated right up front. And that's like we are there too. And we're going to get some first person voiceover. Ever since I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster he's going to open with. Casino, again, set in Las Vegas. And the Irishman, uh, I think he and De Niro had been apart for 20-some years, and then they finally came back together. The Leo movies, and that's where Scorsese finally won his best picture and directing Oscars a few years ago there with The Departed. And we get uh, Matt Damon and Leonardo DiCaprio in The Departed. Uh, Leo in The Aviator and Gangs of New York as well and Shutter Island. Uh, not in Hugo, though, or Silence, uh, but those are some of the Leo films. And I have linked to some scenes for, for The Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, it, it's not exactly a gangster movie, but these uh, New York stockbrokers and, 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 and traders practically are mafia types. Uh, they have parties, they have drugs, they have prostitutes, they have flashy clothes and big cars, so I don't know, maybe maybe Scorsese's telling us that these guys are the new mafia. I don't know, but uh, it's a really fun movie, very funny, way over the top, and uh, we're going to see Leo breaking the fourth wall, talking to the camera, and, uh, and, and voiceover, and very much a first-person uh, experience, just like Ray Liotta in, uh, in Goodfellas, actually. A lot of fun, and he seems to be enjoying all of, all of these drugs. He has a long list of the drugs that he's going to do, um, and, and you know, cocaine and whatever, and quaaludes, and, and marijuana, and booze, and oh my God, such a long list of of drugs, and he seems to be having a pretty good time of it. And those of us in the audience, we kind of have to think to ourselves that this is kind of a mixed message, right? Is he telling us that drugs are fun and good, and his big mistake was getting caught? Or is he telling us that he should never have been doing the drugs in the first place? Because this is a three-hour movie. And for about the first two hours and 45 minutes, he seems to be having a heck of a lot of fun with all of his his uh, uh, drugs and uh, the way he treats women and, and all of that, right? It's really a mixed message. What What is he trying to tell us? And we get that mixed message in Goodfellas as well. What is the message? Hollywood, sadly, uh, does that sort of thing. They show us lots of bad behavior, uh, maybe Scarface, Al Pacino, lots of bad behavior. And then at the very, very tail end of the movie, uh, they get their just desserts. They either get killed in a hail of gunfire or off to prison. Uh, Leo goes off to prison. We never see him in prison or anything like that. And then he comes out and he's advising the FBI. So it, 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 if, we, if we leave the movie after two hours and 45 minutes, it looks like Leo wins and goes out on top. Scorsese and his frequent collaborators, De Niro with 11 now, and Leo with 6, and his editor, Dear Thelma, at 19 and counting. So a lot of the big collaborators for uh, a number of our directors, whether it's uh, uh, Tim Burton, yes, he's worked uh, quite a bit with Johnny Depp, but he has worked far more with Danny Elfman, his main composer. So uh, I don't know what uh, I don't know what Scorsese has coming up next. He's uh, very active. He's probably got something in the works. I'll have to check.